and bless somebody. Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, worship team. Hallelujah. And as you are seated this morning in the presence of the Lord, or even in, at home as you're watching this on site, know that if you believe in God today, there's no distance from God right now. But let me ask a question today because I see some people still having rather anxious looks. <laughs> Are you really feeling tired? Are you having anxieties and worries? Are you facing circumstance or an issue? Is perhaps your job, your career at stake? Perhaps your finances seems rather stretched and things don't look any better with the war, with the global economic downturn. Or perhaps, like here, you're facing some issue that could be in terms of health. Or maybe you're in despair over something that's happened lately. If you are, I have two solutions for you. First, do like our dear little sister here. Get into the presence of God. How do you know that? The Word of God reminds us that when we are in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. And the joy of the Lord will be our strength. How many of you need strength this morning? Amen. Whatever you're facing, that's drain you, you need the strength of the Lord. And know that when you get into the presence of God, where two or three are gathered in His name, the Word of God reminds us that there is glory, that there is power, there is every promise of God that can be fulfilled. There is power that is going to increase. One of us can put a thousand to flight. But two of us put 10,000 to flight, the Word of God says. But how many know that when we are gathered with the presence of God in our midst, we can rout every principality, every power, and every rulers of darkness, and every anxiety and worry, and every situation and circumstance you have can be taken care of. The second thing is to realize that we are living in prophesied times. That we're living in perilous and dangerous times. We're living in times spoken about by Jesus, spoken about by the prophets. If you turn your book, your Bible to Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, you will see the word that was given to Daniel of expectation of a time called the last days. If you turn the Bible and you read Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13, and Luke chapter 21, you can see what is happening around us right now are the very signs that Jesus has spoken about. We are indeed living in times that the Apostle Paul, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Call, behold, you know that in the last days perilous times would come. But the Bible calls us to be wise to the sign of our times. And that's the reason why we read the Bible. That's the reason why we're trying to understand there's a purpose the signs are put there. But not just to be aware of the signs of the times, but to be aware of the times of the signs. You see, the problem is we look at things from our timing. And today in an urbanized society like Singapore, we are very much brought into an instant 
gratification time. Right? We take coffee, we want instant coffee. We take tea, we want instant tea. When you pray, we expect instant answers. Even when we take medication, we expect instant relief. But how many know? We are restricted by chronos. This is the time that we see that we measure in minutes, hours, days, weeks. But how many know the chronos of time of God, you call it chronos, is a time of perfection. God sees time from the beginning to the end. God sees time as one day can be a thousand years, the Apostle Peter said. Or a thousand years, one day. God's timing. It is perfect. Sometimes you get impatient waiting for it. And we hear of the return of Jesus Christ. But after 2,000 years, perhaps the church has got tired. We don't hear what the talk of Jesus Christ is coming back again. But I want to tell you this, that if Jesus does not return as He has promised, we are in trouble. The world is facing climate warming. The world is facing a situation of pollution. The world are facing dynamic situations where there's going to be famine. When I say famine, I mean famine. That even a country like Singapore, with all its advances, there can still be famine. Yes, we are worried about job, uh, food security. We're trying to pile up, we're trying to prepare. But how many know we're still reliant because we can't produce our own food? We can't on our own stop climate warming. We on our own cannot handle the solution of pollution. We on our own, despite all the technology, the wisdom and everything else, cannot handle the fact that there's a hole developing in the ozone layer. And if that hole does not repair itself, one day it can get so big that the oxygen that's around the earth will just flow into the vacuum of outer space. And you and I will just die. <laughs> Is there no hope? Well, God says, the times of the signs. And if you are aware, not just of the signs, but of the times of the signs, we will know that we are in a time that the prophet Daniel, that Jesus himself, that even apostles call the last days. God is still in control. Has not God warned us about the things that are going to happen even this year? Yes, we had a prophetic word. But how many of years who have years that here? We are warned of many things happening this year. Financial issues. We're warned of deceptive things in finances as well. We are warned even of what? That this year we'll not only just see recession, but we're going to enter into a unique condition of seeing inflation. We are warned that there's rumours of wars and there's going to be wars. We are warned that even a potential foundation is set for a military and political alliance between countries like Russia and China. We are warned of many things, even of conflict in Asia, not just in Europe. But how many have years here? You see, Often, too often, we don't use all our five senses. We only hear through what we see. 
we only hear through circumstances and situations. We are only here based on our past experiences. But I want to tell you in these last days, your heart issue is going to be the crux of what you hear and what you see. Today, as we look at all these different crises facing us, I only want to say one thing. Man has no solution. By then, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, we hear these words from the Lord of hosts. For I know the plans I have for each and every one of you. And it's plans of good and not of evil. Are you facing times right now where you can only see good and not evil? Good and not evil of a hope in the future. Do you really see a hope or a future? Or are you just busy slogging, 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 just trying to meet? Are you redeemed from sin? and yet behaving like a sinner. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 26, the Word of God reminds us, it's to sinners that God gives the burden to heap up, to lay up, to accumulate. Are you heaping up? Are you laying up? Are you accumulating? But yet the Word of God says, it is God who will then give it to the person. What you have heaped up, what you laid up, and what you have all accumulated. It's God who will give it to the person that's good in His sight. It's not about your efforts. It's not about your labor. It's not about your ambitions. It's not about your strife. I have learned a hard lesson. I have striven, I labored, I lit up, I thought, like the man said, when my barns are full, I will then be able to rest, enjoy it all. And in stroke, I lost everything. I won't tell you, the Word of God is the Word of God. And there's no error. There's no maybe. It's about yes and amen in Jesus Christ. Amen. And we must realize the word of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 to 8 reminds us that to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Yeah. A time to be born, a time to die. How many know that you can't and will not predict the time you're going to die? <laughs> it's a time even to plant. A time to pluck, to harvest that which is planted. A time to kill. A time to heal. And we go on and we know that there are different seasons. I encourage you to read verses 1 to 8. And you will begin to realize that verse ends with something, a time to speak. And as a time to speak, there's a time to be silent. <laughs> a time to love. A time to hate. A time of war. And a time of peace. And as the verse ends, I want to just remind you of something. In Christian circles, we often use the word shalom. And you ask Bill translate, tell you shalom is peace. One day God asked me, go and study the word shalom. And shalom is more than peace that comes with end of war. It's more than peace that brings serenity into your situation. Shalom carries a peace that goes beyond human understanding. A peace, the word God 
says he will understand the nuance and depth of it. A peace that brings the completeness of God's plan into being. And I want to tell you, the time is here and the time is near. A time indeed to wake up and the time to begin to realize that this is a time where God's see restitution, where God sees reconciliation, where God sees restoration, but even more, in the completeness of God, fulfillment of His plans. And this is so important. And the key for us to understand the second verse I have here is Romans chapter 8, verses 19, that tells us a very, very critical that the world is deteriorating, the world is in gloom and doom. But Romans 8, 19 says, why is it this stage? For the whole of creation should be waiting in expectation Eager expectation. Eager expectation for what? For the sons of God to be revealed. The world is waiting in eager expectation for, some versions say, the manifestation of the sons of glory. If you're a believer today, God is talking about you. God is talking about you. He turn to somebody and say, I see a son of glory. But why are you not being revealed? Why are still you feeling so helpless, so hopeless? Why are you feeling that life does not have a meaning? That life is about nothing but strife and burdens to carry. I want to tell you this. God said it. And God means it. And God will do it. God is revealing a renewed people. God is revealing sons and daughters. God is revealing His glory in you and in me. That we can go from glory to glory. God is revealing a renewed community of people. Not just a church as a denomination, a church as a building, a church as an institution. No! God is revealing the church, the body of Christ today. A body of Christ that will bring a worldwide renewal and revival. This is the final wave of God. And right from 1998, God was giving me that word and I couldn't quite understand it. That the final wave will be word-based, spirit-led and faith-filled. Not only based on the word of God. Not only led by the spirit of God. In leading the spirit will empower the Spirit will transform and the Spirit will change people. Amen. But it calls and it will demand a response in faith. Now, I'm not going to preach about faith. Although faith is about now, faith is based on a hope. But a hope is based on certain reality. There is our human hope. There's worldly hopes. But there's a godly hope. 
enough to say, without faith, we cannot please God. But he that comes in faith must have the centrality of God in your life. That you have come to a state in your life that you are like Paul, when Paul says, only in him can I live, only in him can I do anything, only in him is my whole persona and personality. Do you have the God-given personality? Or do you have a world-given personality? Do you have the hope that the world is giving to you? Or do you have a hope that's given by God? I can't answer this question. You have to. Look back. Review. Look at your life. You know, when we hear prophecy, prophecy is never fortune telling. Prophecy is only God trying to give us leading and guidance. Because God gave you freedom of will. Freedom of choice. And you can choose to live the life you choose. You can be all-knowing and yet be disobedient. You choose. Prophecy calls for us to spend time to hear from God His revelation of the personal application to your life. But not just for revelation. But a challenge for you to obey. How many know that you can know and still be disobedient? God is raising that renewed people that will be first. People that want to draw near to Him. People that will be, have ears that will hear. People that are hard that will be obedient. There are many Christians today they are living in the church of Jesus Christ. They have got one foot in the kingdom of God and two feet in the kingdom of the world. <laughs> How do you know you can't live in two dimensions? But yet, God has called us to live in both dimensions. We are to be in this world, but not of this world. But when we're in the world, it's so easy to be of the world, isn't it? But yet God calls us to be as wise as serpents in the world, but yet as gentle as doves. How do we live contradictions? Not by your strength, not by your might, but it's by His Spirit. I was reminded of that in 1990. That's why when I started ministry, we put that sign, not by strength, not your own strength, not by your own, any mind, anything you can do, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we must realize that God has done His part. His part. In the whole Old Testament, he was preparing us to understand a time to come. A time to come when a new covenant will be effected. A new era will be ushered in. When Jesus will come, live, get tempted, but yet found without sin. That he will become the first man to be indwelled with the Holy Spirit, Son of God but yet in every way, laid aside his divinity to become son of man. To come, to live, to die, and to be raised from the dead. To birth out a new community of people who believe in him who will be called sons and daughters of God. A new community that will become temples of the Holy Spirit a new community to walk in a new covenant and the glory of God. Yes, at Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus was raised from dead, we saw after Jesus ascended, 
In Acts, we've gone through this before. Disciples. Disciples. Let me tell you this. Disciples are people. Jesus has said in John 8, 31. Are not just people who believe in Him. How many know we are all believers? But Jesus said, only if you continue following my word and living my word, then are you my disciples. And the next verse, he says, and it's then. Not just being believers, but living. The kingdom living they came to show. Then are you his disciples. I know many of you may call yourself disciples. But in the final day, Jesus may say, I know you not. It's then that you know the truth. You see, knowledge is important. How many know knowledge is important? And there's no shortage of knowledge today. Even in the kingdom of God. There's Bible schools and Bible schools. There's seminaries and seminaries. And there's cemeteries and cemeteries. Where we go and accumulate knowledge. How many know the Bible says? Knowledge by itself only puffs you up. It doesn't bring you closer to God. If there's no change in your heart, this knowledge is going to bring you into man's ideas, man's agendas, man's plans. I'm sorry. That's what the church is today. I'm not running around the church as a whole. I'm against church as it exists today, as an institution, as a building, as anything, but church is about people. God didn't die for buildings, institution. He died for you, 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 each and every one of you. If he had to die again for you, he would. I'm not saying he needs to. He would. Indeed, John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world. He loves the world. But he just didn't love it. He came and died for it. Are you just loving the world for what the world can give you? Then you'll be caught even with abundance of knowledge. Knowledge that will only bring you away from God. Knowledge where the church, the people of God today are without power. Knowledge where the church of God today is built with, yes, all the different plans, all the different structures, all of it. But yet the presence of God is not there. The Bible says, when the day of Pentecost will fully come, we must remember three things begin to happen in that group of disciples. There was, the Bible says, the sound like the rushing, the mighty rushing wind. The word that the Old Testament called Ruah. The very breath of God that brought the life of God. And that's what Jesus come tried to say. I came to give life and life more abundantly. He came to bring the Zoe of God. The life of God. The breath of God. Without God's breath, there's no life from God. We saw cloven tongues of fire that came. And I've preached about this. The fire is symbolic of the presence of God in a burning bush. The fire represents unquenchable fire that wants to burn off every chaff and every dross and every, every, everything that want to keep you away from the very knowledge of God. And that knowledge is not about knowing Lord knowledge. Revelational knowledge that bring life into action. And when you have that, everything, chaff, dross, everything that's burned off, 
It comes as a refiner fire to refine you until you like pure gold, ready for the Lord's use. Are you ready for the Lord's use? Are you ready just to think that you can live in the kingdom of God and enjoy the blessings? You know, I always remember this song when I was young. I don't hear it nowadays. It's a song that started in the Civil War in the US a long time ago. And this song goes something like this. Freedom isn't free. Freedom isn't free. You got to pay the price. You got to sacrifice. Freedom isn't free. This is a song by... Black slaves. You see, there's a price for everything, even for freedom. And there's a price for what God has already paid for and wants you to have. We saw on the day of Pentecost that people were amazed, people marveled, some mocked. And yet Peter preached such a sermon. Peter would just, yeah, 50 days earlier, was hiding, was denying God. Peter now transformed. Preached a sermon, 3,000 people got saved. You see, and from that, the early church was birthed and renewed. And it continued. So I began to ask myself, what are the hallmarks of this renewed commun community? What is it for us to learn, to understand why we have lost that cutting edge? When I began to look at the Word of God, the first thing I realized that what was preached by the Apostle Peter was something that was affirmed by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians. Chapter 2, verse 4 to 6. I don't want to read that here, but enough to say this. The key of it was, he said, and you know me, my speech and my preaching is not in the enticing wisdom of man, but in a demonstration of Holy Spirit and power. Amen. And that was what Peter stood on the day of Pentecost. Yeah. Holy Spirit and power. It was not his nice words, wise words. In verse 2 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verse 5, sorry. You know, the Apostle Paul added this verse. It's not wisdom of the world, but power of God. Amen. He wants to emphasize this. Not the wisdom of the world, but the power of God. Today, unfortunately, we're the days where Paul says, there's so much wisdom. And the problem is, we think we're wise. We think we have all the answers. Guess what did the Bible say? Yet being wise, they became fools. Yet being wise, they became Fools. You know, I, I just want to lament and weep. The church has become a gathering of foolish people. Your degrees doesn't make you wise. Apart from God, 
you are fools. That's what the Word of God says. And when you are strong, God says, my strength is perfected in your weakness, not your strength, not your self-reliant, not your own ambitions, not on your own strife. But the hallmarks of the renewed community that went on beyond Pentecost was one. They continued steadfast in action. Steadfast in the Apostles' Doctrine. Except 2 verse 42. Steadfast in fellowship. Steadfast in breaking of bread. Steadfast in prayers. Do you know you can't have fellowship sitting at home and watching online? No, no, no. Online is good. It helps. Bring the gospel to places where we cannot reach. How many know to have fellowship? You need to be on site with people. You cannot be having fellowship all by yourself. Fellowship of one is a fellowship of none. Let's get real. You cannot be in prayers. There is a time, yes, for private prayers, for individual prayers. And Jesus wake up early in the morning before the break of dawn. There he went to a quiet place to pray. There's prayers when Jesus talked about, no matter how busy he was, he still would draw in the wilderness to alone to pray. But there's a time of corporate prayer. And they were in one accord, in one place. That's why we decided, finally I was praying, to take our prayer powers offline. Because we need to be corporately here to pray. The anointing comes when two or three are gathered in His name. And it's the key. They continue steadfast. And the Word of God goes on to say this. They became a teaching, learning community based on what? The Apostles' Doctrine. They became a fellowshipping community, one with another. They became a worshipping community as they broke bread, Holy Communion together. They became a prayerful community. Yes, individually and corporately. And Acts 2, 43 tells us, and fear, some versions had it more con- tra- correct, uh, translated correctly, awe, oh, reverence came into the community. And when that happened, this came not just of one person, but it came collectively on every soul. And then we see these words coupled to it. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. You see, corporate anointing does something. We had a precious sister that was healed just like that. I was up here on stage, I didn't go down as the crowds came forward. The anointing of God was enough. Amen. Yes. It's not the anointing of Francis Cook. Yes. Amen. Yes. That we must realize. Second thing I saw in scripture for the hallmark of a renewed community was there was unity in action. They believed all things together. They had started to share in common. They started to even sell. In the new direction, there was unity in faith to believe God. And whenever faith comes, God's love, God's caring, God's sharing 
will be manifested. They sold all their possessions and goods and gave them to others who had need. Faith in action, sharing in love. Today in church, at one time we had this statement in church, loving Jesus, loving one another, and loving others. I ask this question, are we really loving one another or loving others? if we are not able to do sacrificially what our love of Jesus calls us to do. I'm not saying all had to go and sell their properties and everything and come in a squat here in the church. No, no, far from that. <laughs> but you see, there has to be demonstration in action. Too often when you see a brother or sister, and he, come, let me pray for you. Bless you, go. But true faith is not just about praying. James 1.27 says what? True faith is also about caring for widows, caring for orphans, caring. It's about faith in action. Another thing I saw there was in Acts 2.46. Continuing action. And they continued daily with one accord in a temple. Breaking bread from house to house. They'd eat the meal with gladness and singleness of heart. Do you know this word gladness is very important? You know, even Paul warned us. And the Bible also warns us in other parts that if we do not serve God with gladness of heart, we end up serving the enemy. It's true. In a lot of churches, we see people who are serving God, long papaya face. You know, all of a sudden, when they walk to serving, I think the continent, continents change. They become like papayas instead. No, it's a gladness, the gladness of heart. Yeah. In the abundance of all things, not for the abundance of all things. Many people serve because they want abundance of God. In the abundance, whether it's good or bad, where there's difficult times, God is seeing your heart and a gladness of heart. Otherwise, your labor is in vain. That's what the Bible says. They continue daily, not only in a temple, but they continue daily in public. They celebrated each other's homes. You know, I will still remember when I was a young Christian. In the old days, there was a lot of what I call community church. When I first came to Singapore, I was staying in Senate Estate nearby, Cedar Avenue. And there was a church nearby. That's the first church I went to in Singapore. And they were run by Baptist missionaries from America. And I tell you, you never know when they're coming to visit you. All of a sudden, the pastor kind of knocked on the door, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. And my grandmother would say, Oh, boxer lie there, boxer lie there. And everybody get ready. No warning. Today, I get come knock on your door. Hey, pastor, you should call me beforehand. <laughs> right? We, we have become very, very private persons. We don't really open our heart anymore. Sometimes, even in some of our, our meetings, it's hard to get people to host. And this is the crux of what was the key. There were continuous... Also, in feasting and joyfulness. You see, revival will lead, a renewal will lead to revival. Yeah. When you are renewed people, you can expect to see miracle signs and wonders. Yeah. And the Bible then goes on to tell the story of the healing of the lame man at Gate Beautiful of the Temple. Understand that many times Peter and John had gone past the temple, even with Jesus, and there was the lame man, and they didn't do anything for the lame man. But on the day, something was different. Because now, moving under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden, they look at the, the lame man and say, look at me, look at me. The lame man was actually expecting some money. But instead, we hear the words, gold and silver, I have none, but what I have, I give to you. You see, the lame man 
never knew his real need. He was just looking for money. But God wanted to heal him. You see, wherever revival begins to come, opportunities come. Yes, the man was healed. A commotion resulted because the healing is always for a purpose, not just to meet needs. His need could have met many times when Jesus walked by. But it created an opportunity to preach. And you hear Peter preach, and we saw 5,000 people accepted the Lord. Well, I tell you, if we have revival like that, we've got no space in the church. <laughs> But I want to say something, revival will bring opposition. Admittedly, there was opposition. Peter and John got arrested. They were brought the next day for trial. And as they were queried, what happened? Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, stood up and answered every different accusation. And they could find nothing. So what they do? They threatened them. Hey, shut up and don't carry on like that anymore. But they had to release them. I tell you what opposition does. It's not to cower, it's not to make us timid. When we were going to do this forum on faith and sexuality, there was a discussion because there could be a brickback. The gay activists could target us. Was that fear? No. Opposition only brought bonus. So you see in Acts chapter 4, verse 23, so when they released, when they went back to the whole group of friends, what did they do? They began to share how they were threatened and reported all the threats they were made to them. And what happened? Response. And this is important. In face of opposition, turn to God. In face of opposition, they prayed with one accord. In that one accord, they recognized who God is. Who is God to you when you pray? Second, they talk about what God has done for David and through Jesus. And next thing, they got emboldened. Then they begin to ask for what? Strength and boldness to preach even more. Wow, I love that. And the Bible says, what happened? All of a sudden, Acts chapter 431 says, when they had prayed this, the place was shaken like an earthquake had shaken it. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit afresh. You see, the Holy Spirit just don't want to touch you once. He wants to fill you and fill you and fill you until you overflow. You see, it's a constant relationship. A lot of people think, I experienced God one touch, okay, I'm back to the world. No. Constant infilling. And the Bible says what happened? And the multitude would them believe, and they were one heart, one soul, and all of a sudden, you see such unity over the one heart, one soul. We see selfishness begin to come. People started to sell and to, sh to share what they had. And the Bible says these words, I love it. Great grace came upon the church. And they took whatever money they had and laid it at the feet of the apostles. I want to tell you something. This is what makes the difference in the church today. Many churches are forced to do fundraising. <laughs> Many churches are forced to run donation drive. Makes me think that God is no longer in the church. Big question I have. Are we still existing and following the things the Bible tells us of how 
we can maintain renewal? Are we continuing in renewal and expecting revival? Are we ready to move in a final move of God where revival is going to come in such a dimension for God's glory? That's the question I'm going to leave with each and every one of you. Come, let's just stand on our feet before God. And even as you stand on our feet before God, God is bringing a new renewal. God is raising up people of power and of praise. God is raising a community, a body of Christ that will no longer look at circumstances and situation. God is raising a people that will be filled with the Holy Spirit that's ready to move in boldness. People who are ready to say, God, here I am. Use me. This morning, I want to open the altars here. You know, a sermon is nothing unless there's a response. Unless people begin to hear, to choose, and make a commitment. I'm going to ask each and every one of you, these altars are open. I don't worry about what your need is, what your problem is. But are you ready to look beyond your needs and your problem and say, here I am God. Use me. If you are, the altar is open. I want to invite you to come. As you come to dedicate yourself and you stand in the presence of God, you are saying to God, I'm here, Lord. Right now, as Pastor Tricia leads us, the altars are open. Just come right now. Come to the altar. Come to be part of the community of grace and praise. Just come, don't worry, just come, come. Come right now, come close, don't worry. Hallelujah. As you come right now, you're saying, God, I'm here. 